There are so many different key markers that people look at to try to understand what's going on with somebody's digestive health and efficiency. Me, from my perspective, I try to look at a lot of different things because there's no one answer that's really going to give you, you know, the end-all be-all of what is really going on in the, the gut and the microbiome. So I look at a lot of different tests and I look at some of the key things I look at are how diverse the microbiome is. You know, what kind of bacteria are there? Are, are the, is the person missing certain keystone species that are very helpful in balancing digestive health and keeping inflammation controlled? But it's not just the microbiome itself and the individual microbes that I look at as important. Those are certainly key components of everything, but there's more to it than that. We want to look and see what is the ecosystem actually doing? What is it producing? What are some of the products that the microbiome is actually making? And so I look at things like short-chain fatty acids, uh, such as butyrate. Everybody knows butyrate. Um, that gives you an idea of how much uh, anti-inflammatory capacity the microbiome has. Because butyrate is a short-chain fatty acid that can act as an anti-inflammatory. So that's an important thing to know, whether you have uh, the capacity for production for that and whether the levels are adequate or not. I also look for calprotectin. Calprotectin is uh, one of a few other uh, markers for inflammation. If there's pretty high or moderate high level of inflammation in the gut, then we want to look and see what are some of the things that the person could have as a diagnosis and what are other things that we need to do or what kind of medications or supplements might they need to be on to help control that. Sometimes people have inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease or microscopic colitis or some inflammatory condition that they don't know about, and a calprotectin is going to help them figure that out. I guess another one of the key components that I um, like to check for is <clears throat> pancreatic elastase. The pancreas also contributes to digestion as well. And so when the pancreas doesn't produce <clears throat> enough uh, digestive enzymes to help you process the foods, then you can also develop certain kinds of symptoms as well. And so if pancreatic elastase is low, then we know that we need to work on something in that regards as well. It's a really complicated question when, you're, when we're talking about uh, trying to understand the root cause of gastrointestinal symptoms. What I like to do is kind of dial things back a bit because the way I look at the gut, my, the gut and the gut microbiome is that the gut is actually the tattletale of the body. So when somebody has digestive symptoms, that doesn't necessarily always mean that 100% of the problem is actually a gut problem. Uh, sometimes a digestive symptom is a reflection of something else going on in the body, like whether you're exposed to toxins or whether there's too much stress in your life whether you're not exercising enough or whether you're eating the wrong kinds of foods. And sometimes we get other problems, autoimmune conditions, even, you know, uh, other kinds of problems like even cancers and things like that can actually be a reflection of an imbalance in digestive health. So when I look at somebody's digestive symptoms, I always try to dial it back and say, what else is going on? What other diagnoses do they carry? What else can we do to look into where these problems could be coming from? And then I try to frame it in the setting of their digestive symptoms and see where they could be coming from. So it's really a comprehensive approach. And this is really, you know, one of the great things that we have the ability to do these days with precision medicine, all the advancement in technology. Um, that we can look at all these uh, various different components of health and try to figure things out. Lifestyle interventions are such an important component of health. One of the slides that I usually give on a presentation um, uh, outlines that, you know, don't forget the basics. The basics of life and lifestyle are some of the most important components of optimizing whole health, and we often take them for granted. We underestimate the power of lifestyle medicine. And, you know, even things such as sleeping the right amount can affect your gut health. 
There's plenty of literature showing how alterations in circadian rhythms can actually impact the gut microbiome and change the composition of the microbiome. What's interesting is that some of these changes that can occur with alterations in sleep cycles are actually some of the same changes that can occur in people that have obesity and other inflammatory problems and cognitive problems. So you can easily see as using sleep as an example how that lifestyle intervention of trying to sleep better can actually optimize how your brain works and you know how you feel in general and and the and your you know ability to lose weight um, sometimes people that are having problems losing weight but they say they're eating the right foods and they're exercising you talk to them enough you find out that you know they're sleeping three or four hours a day so that lifestyle intervention in that situation may be what they need to help them get to the next level you know, diet is also very important. We all often talk about diet. I often try to make diet my last point. We all know that diet is an important lifestyle intervention. We all know that exercise is an important lifestyle intervention. So what I try to do is I mention those, but I always focus on them last because it's the sleep, it's the stress reduction, it's the exposure to toxins, it's the social interconnectedness. Those things are also a very important part of lifestyle measures are often the undervalued components. And all of these parts actually can impact the gut microbiome and how we work and how our body operates as an entire system. So they're very important to include. It can be really tough when somebody comes to you with one particular kind of symptom and then the symptom changes as you're going along the process of their evaluation and management. So what's important is really, you know, um, what I like to say, dial it back a moment. So first look and see what happened between the first time you saw them and the next time you saw them and what are the symptoms that are going along. Is it something that you're doing, you know, with therapy? Because sometimes certain supplements or other management uh, tools that you use can actually cause problems. So just because we use something and we know that you know, it can be helpful in X, Y, Z doesn't mean that that person is necessarily going to have that advantage. They could have the opposite problem. And we want to look at what's happening in their diet, what's happening with their stress levels, what's happening with their sleep levels. Are there major changes that are happening in their lifestyle? It's funny to say because it sounds like, you know, oh, you have such a complex patient with so many different problems and why are you focusing on these simple things? But actually, much of the time, you may find that these are the simple things that are actually causing the problems because if you don't stop for a second to talk to the patient, then you're going to totally miss it. So I often remind people that the number one, two, and three tests that you do with any patient is actually talking to them. Because by talking to them, you can solve a lot of the puzzles that you wouldn't get by any actual kind of test. And you know, the other part of this is to actually figure out what kind of symptoms are they having? Are they having bloating? Are they more constipated? Are they, you know, what what is the actual digestive symptom that's going on? And then try to figure out what could be going on as an underlying factor that's driving that. Have they developed small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? You know, is their constipation getting worse because of something that they're doing? Uh, something along those lines. You know, there's so many different scenarios that you can think of as far as changing symptoms. But I think trying to dial it back and trying to keep it as simple as possible when you're looking at the problem and then moving forward is probably a better approach than trying to go for the most complex way. So, you know, the alternative would be you could just say, okay, well, your symptoms change. We're going to order 50 different tests. And you order 50 different tests, that might just actually confuse things a little bit more. So that's why I'm trying to say just, just try to keep it simple by dialing it back first before you actually move forward. Probiotics is such a huge topic these days. It almost feels like it's more complicated now than it was maybe five or ten years ago. I think our knowledge base is changing so much, and that's probably part of that whole reason. We're learning that certain strains of a particular bacteria can 
help with certain kinds of conditions. And so people are trying to now figure out and learn what kind of probiotics we need for particular conditions and, you know, symptoms or issues. And so it's become a little complicated in that regards. I do use probiotics often. I think that it's an important part of a daily routine. But in some circumstances, probiotics are not necessarily the right thing to do or maybe not the right thing to do at that moment. Sometimes uh, people that have a, a complete dysbiosis or imbalance in the gut microbiome um, or that have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you'll find that if they say that they take probiotics, they actually get worse. So I kind of relate that to um, uh, an analogy that I make. It's like you get uh, 100 people in a room and the room is past capacity. You're going to break all the laws. The fire marshal is going to come in and say, you know, there's way too many people in here. So you have two options. One, you can handle that and say, okay, everybody, we need some of you to get out so that we can keep this room safe. Or you can send 100 more people in there to bum rush everybody and hope you squeeze them out. And so that, that's kind of the uh, concept of probiotics in the setting of an imbalance where there's dysbiosis and too many bacteria overgrowing in a particular place. Those 100 extra people that you send in there to bum rush those other 100 people, they might not leave. So they may stay and then the problem gets even worse. And so, I, you know, you have to kind of look at what's going on with the person. Do they want the probiotic because they have a lot of bloating and belching and their bowels are off? Well, stop for a second and think, you know, do they have SIBO? Do I need to treat that first before I introduce a probiotic? Or are they looking for general gut health and things are going well, they're going to be traveling, the winter time's coming up, they want to beef up their immune system? Or do they have inflammatory bowel disease and we're looking for something to try to, you know, help modify, you know, the outcome of the inflammatory bowel disease by putting in bacteria that help reduce inflammation. So it's really a personalized approach, I guess, is what I'm kind of getting at these days. Before, we would just say, oh, probiotics, good, take probiotics. Now we know that, you know, everybody is different. Every person's microbiome is 10 to 20 percent similar only. So if everybody's microbiome is so different, it's impossible to really say that everybody should take this one particular probiotic. You really have to take a precision-based approach to that. Precision medicine is really the way of the future. There are two kinds of doctors. There's a kind of doctor that will take care of you when you're sick and you need an intervention in order to live. And then there's the other kind of doctor. There's the other kind of doctor that wants to prevent you from actually getting sick in the first place. And I think that's where we're at with a lot of the integrative and functional medicine practitioners these days. That's what appeals to a lot of us. I have the opportunity or privilege, I would say, of being able to do both. I'm an actively practicing gastroenterologist, but I also have a precision-based practice as well. So in that precision-based practice, we try to look at all the components of health that can really impact somebody. We look at all the lifestyle measures, we look at toxins, the microbiome, genetics, we look at imaging, we try to help risk stratify cardiac disease, Alzheimer's disease, all these conditions, autoimmunity, you know, all these conditions that people have concerns of developing or wanting to prevent. And precision medicine really means that you look at all these components and you try to figure out what are some of the things that can impact your health in these regards and what interventions can you make so that you don't actually get the problem in the first place. So it's one thing when you actually get the problem. It's another thing to actually reverse and prevent the problem from happening in the first place. To me, that's what precision medicine really is. You really look at all the factors of that one individual and try to look at all of those things together in one picture so that you can try to precisely get to the root cause of every issue of that person and try to prevent the problems from happening in the first place. That's what it's really all about. Because if you look at statistical data on a particular disease and you say, oh, well, it looks like I have the gene for Alzheimer's disease, and that means that, oh my God, I'm going to get Alzheimer's. 
Well, you're looking at a statistic or research studies based on a population of people. But that population does not necessarily mean you. So if you look at all the factors that affect you, and then you take that in conjunction with you know, imaging and genetics, then you really have an understanding of what your risk is for certain things. That's what precision medicine really is.